Hi guys, I'm Eric Voss, and Star Wars Episode VIII The Last Jedi might have been the meatiest, most narratively packed Star Wars film I've ever feasted on. And guys, I'm stuffed. Stuffed with Easter eggs, subtle visual, music choices, cameos, and callbacks to past Star Wars films, little cool things the movie did to foreshadow and pay off itself. Now, I know some fans weren't crazy about all the elements in The Last Jedi, but trust someone who's seen it so many times he's now on first name basis with AMC's Ushers. The more you watch this movie, the more you'll love it. So breathe, reach out, and join an obsessive fanboy as we rewatch together The Last Jedi to point out everything you missed. And spoilers ahead if you haven't seen the movie, get out of here, you dum dum. Let us begin, as all films in the Star Wars saga do, with the opening crawl. The first new text we see for this movie is The First Order Reigns. This simple sentence was actually a crucial move by the filmmakers. Many viewers of The Force Awakens responded that they weren't totally clear how impactful the reason Resistance's victory was with the destruction of Starkiller Base. Did the Resistance win? Not quite. Right. It's funny how after many fans watched the original Star Wars, they assumed the Rebels destroying the Death Star was the end of that war too. Not quite. Like many things with J.J. Abrams' movie, history definitely repeats itself, along with the audience celebrating way too soon. So like the opening crawl of The Empire Strikes Back, which began with the sobering line, it is a dark time for the rebellion, Ryan Johnson made it very clear here that the Resistance is on the defensive. Then after the crawl finishes, The Last Jedi follows Star Wars tradition by panning to a shot of a spacecraft. In this case, this is the Resistance flagship, a cruiser called the Radis. It's named after Admiral Radis, the rebel leader who led the mission to retrieve the Death Star plans, whom we saw in Rogue One last year. It's fitting that this movie opens with this memory of a tragic rebel sacrifice that left but a spark alive that would later bring down the Empire, summed up then by a young General Organa. Hope. Hope you got a lot of hope because this movie is gonna be a downer. Down on the rebel base of Dakar, we see Lieutenant Conix, returning from The Force Awakens. She's played by Billy Lord, real-life daughter of Carrie Fisher. Her role has been very much expanded for this movie. So as a role of General Hux, played by Donald Gleason. Joining him as First Order officers are a few familiar cameos. Captain Peavy, the officer who reports to him, is Adrian Edmondson, British sitcom actor. And the technician below is Kate Dickey, aka Liza Aaron on Game of Thrones. Over on the Dreadnought, the Captain Kennedy is another Game of Thrones actor. Mark Lewis Jones, he played Shaga the Hill Tribesman in season one. Behind the scenes, many of the stunt performers of The Last Jedi have also worked on Game of Thrones. Then when Poe confronts the Star Destroyer in his X-Wing, it's an interesting exchange between him and BB-8. The droid beeps nervously and Poe responds, happy beeps here buddy, come on. Then Leia weighs in over the transmission, I'm with the droid on this. Now people have been pointing out that we don't really hear anyone explicitly say in this movie the line, I got a bad feeling about this. That's a classic running gag of all the Star Wars movies. Ryan Johnson insisted on Twitter that the line was in the movie, and based on the context of this exchange, BB-8's probably saying the line here. I'm sure we'll get confirmation when the binary droid speak translation comes out. Let's talk about Leia here. This is Carrie Fisher's final on-screen performance, and it may be her finest acting as a character. She conveyed both the wariness of a resistance leader and the spark and the wit that Leia has always possessed. Check out her hair and wardrobe. According to the movie's visual dictionary, Leia's hair is wrapped in a mourning braid, traditional to her home planet of Alderaan. She has also changed her clothes to muted colors to reflect her ongoing mourning for Han Solo. When Poe teases Hux, holding for General Hux, hello, he undercuts the seriousness of this situation with a humor that's very similar to the way he began The Force Awakens. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first. In both cases, it indicates to us that these movies aren't being so sacred when it comes to everyone's outlook on these events. During this battle, Poe talks with this A-Wing pilot. Her name is Tally Lintra. Poe actually has a special affection for A-Wing pilots. In the Star Wars novels, Poe's mother was named Shara Bay, and she was an A-Wing pilot during the Battle of Endor. Maybe you also noticed this ring that Poe carries on a necklace around his neck. According to the Visual Dictionary, that ring was given to him by his mother, so it's possible that maybe Tally reminds him in some ways of his mother. These Resistance bombers are based, like many Star Wars spacecrafts are, on classic real-world bombers, with a three-person crew consisting of a pilot, a bombardier, and a gunner to protect the ship. Ryan Johnson said that he was inspired by the movie 12 O'Clock High, which is about an American bomber crew during World War II. He had his crew watch this movie before Last Jedi production began, and you can see how some of the shots
shots of the gunners inspired the battle imagery of this scene. The gunner who saves the day here is Paige Tico. She's the sister of Rose, whom we meet later. They both carry this same hazy and smelt medallion pendant around their necks. When Snoke's hologram surprises Hux on the bridge, turning him into a human Swiffer, this is actually an important indicator that shows us the depth of Snoke's force abilities. The fact that he can force, pull, and push Hux around, despite being in a totally different location, tells us that Snoke's powers transcend great distances, which will definitely come into play later when he reveals he was the one who linked Rey and Kylo. Now, before we see Finn in this hilarious leaking back to healing suit, I like that the designers included the detail of these Arabesh letters on the lid. They translate to the word stable. I'm actually obsessed with all the Arabesh the designers snuck into this movie, and I'll be pointing out more as we go. I also like how this scene with Poe ends in this exchange. You must have a thousand questions. And then Finn responds, where's Rey? This is a fun wink from the script directly to the audience. We are also coming in this movie with a thousand questions, and really the only one we want answered right now is where the hell is Rey? And immediately we move on to Octu and find out. This scene picks up immediately where The Force Awakens left off, with Rey handing Luke his old lightsaber. Cool detail here, if you look closely at Luke's artificial hand, notice how it still has the blaster scar from when it was shot at the beginning of Return of the Jedi. And Luke chucking the saber over his shoulder is an early example of this film's deeper meaning. The these precious moments aren't meant to be seen as sacred. The Last Jedi asks us to let go from the past and explore these characters as real human beings. I actually did a whole other video that went into this secret agenda by the filmmakers that you should definitely go check out. Still, like Rey, this movie can't help but remind us of the past. Notice how Rey spots Luke's X-Wing submerged in the water. In a way, that's a nod to The Empire Strikes Back when Luke tried to use the Force to dredge his X-Wing out of the swamp water. The fact that he just lets it sit sunken down there tells us a lot about Luke state of mind. He has no intention of leaving this island or using the force to give him the opportunity to do so. Also, notice how that fighter is missing a panel from its wing. If you look closely at Luke's home, you'll notice that he's using that panel as a makeshift door. So rather than using this X-Wing as a means for escape, he's using it to further entrench himself in this place. Personally, I really love the Porgs in this movie. Unlike the Ewoks, which a lot of people are comparing them to, the Porgs are really just here for pure physical comedy, and they never really try to save the day. It's actually super funny when they die. Like, for example, I think we all really wanted that one Porg to ignite the lightsaber when the other one was peering into the emitter. Oh, we are so close. By the way, these Porgs were inspired by real-life puffins that inhabit the island of Skellig Michael where they shot all this stuff. So they weren't just random cash grabs by Disney. They were creatures inspired by real-life nature that became cash grabs by Disney. Inside Luke's home are a few interesting Easter eggs. First, there's this hanging necklace containing a red crystal. According to the Visual Dictionary, that's a Jedi Crusader pendant, a kind of trophy that contains a Sith lightsaber crystal. Unlike the blue and green kyber crystals that Jedi use, Sith use red synthetic ones. Some believe that red crystal in there might have been from the lightsaber of Luke's father, Darth Vader, but the description of Jedi Crusader could also be a reference to a different Sith from the expanded universe, Darth Ravan, who also began as a Jedi Knight who led a group called the Jedi Crusaders. There's also this compass, and that should be familiar to those of you who played Star Wars Battlefront Two. In the game, Luke actually finds this compass. It's what leads him to this island on Ach 2. When Chewbacca kicks down the door, I like how Hamill momentarily softens his character, his voice reverting back to his younger self from the original trilogy. It's almost like he de-ages 30 years whenever he's around R2 or Yoda, really anyone from the OG. Like Carrie Fisher, Hamill does a remarkable job handling that balance of how we remember the character with the more hardened soul that they would have aged into. Moving on to the throne room of Supreme Leader Snoke on board the Supreme Supremacy. Clearly, it's meant to evoke the throne room of Emperor Palpatine. Being flanked by these red Praetorian guards definitely recalls Palpatine's red royal guard. But these guys are way more deadly than we ever got to see the Imperial Guards be. As we see later, they're true melee fighters with a variety of different weapons. And Snoke is definitely more extravagant in a lot of ways. He prefers bright red curtains and golden robes, a choice that Andy Serkis, who voiced in mocap the character, confirmed was based on Hugh Hefner. Unfortunately, we don't learn a lot about Snoke this movie. All those theories that he could be Darth Plagueis the Wise, Sidious's old master. Not quite. He's Jar Jar, obviously. <laughs> All we really know about Snoke's past is that he hails from the Unknown Regions, a mysterious corner of the galaxy that has come up in the EU novels. The book Aftermath Empire's End includes a passage about Palpatine sensing a presence in the Unknown Regions, which many believe could have been Snoke waiting to take over in his absence. But if you look closely at Snoke, we do get some possible clues about his origin. He wears a ring on his finger, and the center is 
a black stone. That's obsidian, which is the same rock in the volcanic caverns beneath Darth Vader's castle on Mustafar. So it's possible that Snoke's origin could be connected to the ancient Sith cave that Vader supposedly built his temple on. That ring is also engraved with images of these four figures. Now these are the four sages of Duarte, ancient philosophers who date way back to the early Republic. Their names are Sistros, Feia, Yanjon, and Brata. And these four were more popular among the Sith than the Jedi because they favored thought over morality, encouraging exploration of the dark side. We've actually seen these four figures before as statues in Palpatine's office in Revenge of the Sith. So another theory is that Snoke is one of these ancient sages. Perhaps Brata himself, he was the one who pushed the dark side exploration the most. It's kind of like the Salazar Slytherin of the group. Oh, that was the uh, voice of millions of voices of nerds crying out in terror at their computers. In this scene, I like how Snoke begins by telling Kylo, you wonder why I keep a rabid cur in such a place of power? Because weakness, properly manipulated, can be a sharp tool. He's referring to the manipulating of Hux in this moment, but by the end of the scene, it's clear he's also referring to the manipulation of Kylo's weakness. He mocks his apprentice's emulation of Vader, calling him a child in a mask. When that mask gets removed, you may have noticed how the scar on Kylo's face has changed position from where it was at the end of The Force Awakens. Then it went across the bridge of his nose. Now it goes down on the one side of his face, which makes him look a lot like his grandfather did in Revenge of the Sith. I also love how John Williams includes an echo of the Imperial March when Vader gets mentioned here, but when Kylo smashes his Vader-inspired helmet, Williams' Kylo Ren music theme takes over, with the Imperial March never to be heard again. This is an example of how Kylo is letting go of his past, releasing himself from the impersonation that made him a bit of a hack. Back on Notch 2, Luke says to Rey, you think I'm gonna walk out with a laser sword and face down the whole First Order? And that's interesting for a couple reasons. One, Luke does exactly that at the end of the movie. Well, uh, sort of a force projection of him does that. But also, Luke says laser sword, not lightsaber. This is actually a throwback to George Lucas' original drafts and story treatments for the Star Wars script, which used the noticeably less elegant term of laser sword instead of the more civilized lightsaber. As Rey follows Luke as he hikes around the island, we get more looks at Ach 2's interesting animal life. First, you can see the tail of a large sea creature slipping beneath the waves behind Rey. But we also meet my favorite of these creatures, the Thala Sirens, the flippered marine animals that Luke gathers yummy yummy green milk from. And yes, this is green milk, not to be confused with the blue milk that Luke drank on Tatooine. That was Bantha milk. By the way, that also showed up in Rogue One. Now, these things are called Thala Sirens as a reference to Greek mythology. The Sirens were creatures who lured in sailors with an enchanting song that would cause the ships to wreck on the rocks of the shore. And yeah, how could you not be lured in by these sexy ass chill milk walruses? Mm -mm. <laughs> Moving on to Rey's discovery of the ancient Jedi temple. Notice how it's housed in the hollowed out trunk of an ancient tree. Now in the past, I speculated that there could be a connection with the force trees from the legend story Shattered Empire. But actually this tree is called an Uneti tree. And the wood does have a spiritual significance. In Rogue One, the character Chirrut Imwe staff was made out of Unetti wood. Inside, Luke repeatedly asks Rey one of those 1,000 questions that was referenced before. Who are you? Eventually, Rey responds that she's from nowhere, which interestingly sets up the underwhelming reveal of her parentage later on. As Kylo helps her admit, Rey is truly a nobody from nowhere, something this movie teases in its first act right here. These books that Luke talks about contain this symbol. Now, this is a sigil of the Jedi Order. It takes the shape of a lightsaber, or laser sword, flanked by two wings. Later, this would inspire the same shape of the Rebellion sigil, which shows up again in this film's closing frames. Now here, Rey references the awakening she experienced in The Force Awakens, and Luke responds by saying, you need a teacher. Now that's a callback to Kylo's line in The Force Awakens. You need a teacher! And this sets up Luke and Kylo as competing influences on Rey's future as a Jedi trainee. Now it's here where Luke bums out Rey by stating, It's time for the Jedi to end. Mark Hamill said that he initially wasn't a fan of Ryan Johnson's cynical take on the character of Luke, telling him, I pretty much fundamentally disagree with every choice you've made. But he said after getting that off his chest, he decided to do his best to realize that vision. Oh, Mark Hamill, does your good nature know any limit? What a great guy. Back on the Radis, Leia slaps Poe for disobeying her order earlier on, which Oscar Isaac said they did 27 takes of. It ended up being like 27 takes of Carrie just 
leaning in. And every time she'd hit like a different spot in my face. <laughs> Leia tells Poe, there are things you cannot solve by jumping in an X-wing and blowing something up. I need you to learn that. This is another example of this thematic separation from the past films. It's The Last Jedi's way of explaining how Poe jumping in an X-wing to blow up Starkiller Base, as well as Luke jumping in an X-wing to blow up the Death Star in the first movie, is kind of an overly simple solution that doesn't apply to all situations. Sometimes a messier, more patient strategy is the wisest course. Now, I go deeper into that lesson in my other analysis, so go check that out. We get a quick cameo from Admiral Akbar here, who orders to sound the alarm. There's also a quick cameo from actress Michaela Cole from Black Mirror as a resistance communications officer who says, they found us. As Kylo leads the assault on the resistance fleet, you may have noticed him doing a barrel roll, similar to his grandfather's move in Revenge of the Sith, and actually earlier in Phantom Menace. Then we get this fascinating moment of hesitation from Kylo that we saw in the trailer, when he has his mother Leia in his sights, but he decides not to fire. Now why does Kylo hold back here? Hold on to that thought, I have a pretty mind-blowing theory on that that I will blow your mind with later. But in one of Ryan Johnson's many twists in this movie, the bridge gets destroyed anyway, with Kylo's other TIE fighters taking it out. Okay, let's talk about this insane scene with Leia. First off, the composition of these shots is just gorgeous. It's like a painting, something intended to look surreal. And I think that's by design. Leia's embrace of her force abilities here is kind of a poetic ballet, similar to Rey's surreal encounter with the Force and the Force Awakens. This imagery actually connects in an interesting way to an anecdote Carrie Fisher brought up in her one-woman show, Wishful Drinking. She recalled how George Lucas told her she couldn't wear a bra under her Leia costume because, in his words, the weightlessness of space causes your body to expand and the underwear would strangle you. And Carrie Fisher joked, no matter how I go, I want it reported that I drowned in moonlight, strangled by my own bra. I don't know if it's intentional, but I think it's interesting how, for the briefest of moments, we see Carrie Fisher drowned in moonlight. No word about any strangling undergarments. But the real question is, how is Leia able to do this? In Return of the Jedi, she only began to even learn of her connection to the Force, which seems to have only manifested so far in the form of feelings and, like, minor clairvoyance. But according to this film's visual dictionary, Leia did begin training as a Jedi after the events of Return of the Jedi, which might explain how she's able to create this pocket of pressurized air air around herself and glide back into the Rattus. If you look closely, you can see some layers of frost that form around her skin. Those could be forming a sort of bubble seal that allows her to survive for at least a brief moment. Now, some of you suggested that Leia isn't moving herself here, but she's moving the ship closer to her? And not quite. If that was the case, she wouldn't need to move all the other pieces of debris that move behind her, too. And yeah, that would take an even more tremendous force than just moving herself. But one detail I loved here is notice how when Leia floats back in the wreckage of the bridge, her body passes through the hologram of the supremacy, severing it. That's a really cool visual foreshadowing for Holdo's kamikaze strike later on. Back on Notch 2, Luke reboards the Millennium Falcon and he retrieves these golden dice. Now, for those who don't remember, these were barely visible in the first Star Wars, hanging at the top of the frame in the Falcon cockpit, though they didn't show up in the sequels. According to Pablo Hidalgo, head of the Lucasfilm Story Group, it's rumored that Han used these dice to win the Millennium Falcon from Lando Calrissian in a game of Corelli and Spike. Whether or not that's true, we do know that Han just keeps them as a good luck charm. Luke uses them in this movie as a token of Han's memory. And of course, we get another sweet throwback to the original film when R2 plays the old Leia transmission. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. Back on the Raddus, we meet Laura Dern's character, Vice Admiral Amelyn Holdo. The novel, Leia, Prince of Alderaan, explains how Leia and Amelyn were friends as young women serving in the Imperial Senate. Holdo's purple hair isn't just a random detail here, it's actually a reflection of her rebellious nature as a girl. She started dying at a young age because she wanted to go against the grain of her upbringing. And notice how she wears these two bracelets. They're designed with constellations that are visible from her home world. Also from a young age, Holdo has been obsessed with astronomy, which actually serves her well in this movie as she navigates the Raditz to an undisclosed rebel base. Now, as she addresses the troops, we see what's left of the Resistance fighters, and it's hard to tell where, but somewhere among these fighters, either in this scene or in others, are more cameos by director Edgar Wright and his brother Oscar, actors Navin Chowdhury and Noah Sagan, who has actually appeared in all of Ryan Johnson's films, also make cameos among the Resistance across this movie. And there's definitely a shot of our old pal Nian Nun, who piloted the Falcon with Lando in Return of the Jedi. He also made an appearance in The Force Awakens. Next up, Finn runs into Rogue 
Rose Tico when he tries to escape. Rose's uniform has the Orbish letters GLD, standing for Ground Logistics Division. Meanwhile, you may have noticed Finn's jacket is stitched up. He got that jacket from Poe in The Force Awakens. And later, Kylo Ren's lightsaber burned a huge gash into it. The Visual Dictionary confirms that Finn did the stitching himself. I just like that we get to see more of Finn's scoundrel behavior in this movie, with him trying to bullshit Rose by heroically telling her, may the Force be with you. He uses the same exact bravado that he tried to use on Rey in The Force Awakens. With the resistance, yeah. And after a fun cameo by Maz Kanata, let's jump ahead to the first of Rey and Kylo's Force FaceTimes. The lighting pulls off some interesting tricks to connect these two. Notice how each has a similar tiny beam of light on their faces. To me, I just like how this kind of reflects the perception of Snoke as he's peeking into each of their minds. Outside, we meet the caretakers of Ach 2. These are a race called the Lene. Now, all of these caretakers are females, but there are male Lene called the Visitors who only visit part of the year for breeding. Up on the Island's peak, notice this pool of water covering a mosaic pattern. This image is called the Prime Jedi. It shows a kneeling figure divided into light and dark. Now, some have suggested that this image looks kind of like Snoke, by the way, but I don't think that's the case because Snoke doesn't really show any of the light that this figure seems to represent. But this figure is a reflection of the first lesson that Luke explains to Rey, which honestly might be the best visual explanation we've ever gotten of the Force in any Star Wars movie. The editing intercuts visual examples of all the dualities that Rey senses around the island. Life and death, warm and cold, peace and violence. And the Force as the energy that connects all of these polarities. Like that image of the Prime Jedi, this sequence provides such a strong depiction of how the Force is actually something that requires both good and evil elements, rather than something that we previously understood really belonged to the peaceful Jedi. We also see how this sense of balance applies to the geology of the island itself. The surface is basked in sunlight, with no trees to provide shade even, but it sits atop a very dark Sith cave, which Rey will explore later on. I also like how Luke begins this lesson by teasing and swatting at Rey, which is actually how Yoda began teaching him in Empire. After this lesson, Rey again forced times with Kylo, and I love the visual parallelism once again, this time between the falling rain where Rey is, and the raining sparks behind Kylo on the Supremacy. So yet another example of those dualities of the different sides of the Force represent, water and fire. Okay, moving on to Finn and Rose's search for the Master Code breaker on Canto Bite, the casino resort for the wealthy war profiteers of the galaxy. Now you might have noticed these trees that line the city's streets. According to the Visual Dictionary, those trees are a species native to Alderaan, Leia's homeworld that got destroyed. Canto Bite kept them in these seed banks. Of course, Alderaan's destruction made them a super rare luxury. And another example of how this morally bankrupt society profits from the pain and suffering of the rest of the galaxy. And we also meet this one alien dude complaining to the police that Finn and Rose parked on his beach. Now this guy is named Slow. Lowen Low. He apparently made a fortune selling driftwood sculptures, which sounds like a made-up career that I definitely want. Slowen Low is a member of the Abednado race, kind of like the resistance fighter Elo Asti from The Force Awakens. Now, as an inside joke, the designers name all these Abednado characters after songs by the Beastie Boys, which is a favorite of J.J. Abrams. Elo Asti was named after Hello Nasty. There were others named Ilko Muniko for ill communication, Rue Down for Root Down, and Grassmon Key or intergalactic. No, brass monkey. Now, Slow and Low is named after Slow and Low, and he's voiced by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, longtime collaborator of Ryan Johnson. Now, inside the casinos are even more cameos. You can briefly see this flat-nosed, slapping alien. This guy's name is Wadaben, and he's played by Warwick Davis. Keeping up with his tradition of playing W-named characters in Star Wars movies, he started as a kid playing Wicket the Ewok in Return of the Jedi. He played Wald and Weasel in Phantom Menace, Wallavan in Maz Kanata's bar in The Force Awakens, and Weeteeth Cubie partisan fighter on Jetta in Rogue One. There's also a cameo by Gary Fisher, Carrie Fisher's dog, who plays Space Gary Fisher, made up as an alien pup. Mark Hamill actually voices an additional character for this scene, Dabu Ske, the leprechaun-looking dude who thinks BB-8 is a slot machine. Later, you can actually hear Dabu laughing with his cackle sounding very similar to Hamill's laugh as the Joker in Batman the Animated Series. The original Master Codebreaker thereafter, with the red flower on his lapel, is played by actor Justin Thoreau from The Leftovers, and the woman accompanying him is named Lovely, 
Marie. She's played by model actress Lily Cole. Outside, Finn and Rose spot some abused kids who work on the Favier stables. The main one, who shows up in the final scene of the film, is played by a kid named Pierce Gagnon. Ryan Johnson previously worked with this kid in the film Looper. He plays a kid with some terrifying telekinetic powers, which makes it interesting how he later proves to be Force-sensitive in this movie, too. Now, not everyone was crazy about this B story on Canto Bites, largely because it feels just a little out of place in the story. But I don't think it makes it bad. There's still an important reason this is part of The Last Jedi, but that is another thing that I go into in that other video that you should definitely watch. But let's wrap up this Canto Bites storyline. In the jail cell, Finn and Rose run into Benicio Del Toro's character, known only as DJ. Now, his name and origin aren't revealed explicitly in the movie, but he has a cap that contains a tin plate with Orabish letters reading, don't join. That reflects DJ's neutral worldview, playing all sides to advance his own interest as much as possible. When they break out of the cell, notice the helmets of the guards. Those letters are Arabesh for CBPD, or Cantobite Police Department. Apparently, the police of this planet are completely controlled by the wealthy elite, like a private security force. Now, in order to escape, Rose gives the stable boy her resistance ring. According to the Visual Dictionary, that ring has been passed down over the decades, previously worn in the halls of the Imperial Senate during the Galactic Civil War, with this secret inner engraving to show proof of rebel loyalty. And right before they escape, we get a fun callback to The Force Awakens, with Finn's ship exploding right before they get to it, just like the one he and Rey almost took in the Jakku scrapyard before choosing the Falcon instead. Okay, back to the Rey storyline. When Rey trains with the bow staff and lightsaber on the cliff, John Williams scores her with the Rey theme from The Force Awakens. Remember, in that movie, it played while showing Rey in her natural element, going through her daily routine. So bringing it back here suggests that Luke sees Rey with a lightsaber in hand as someone in her natural element. This is the life she's destined to lead. And when that slab of boulder crushes the caretaker's wheelbarrow, for a second you can make out that that wheelbarrow was made out of bones, a ribcage of some large creature. It might be the same species that we saw briefly earlier when Rey described death in her forced vision montage. Later, when Luke lectures Rey on the failures of the Jedi philosophy, he mentions that at the height of their power, they allowed for Darth Sidious to take over. It's interesting that Luke says Darth Sidious and not Emperor Palpatine. The character was only ever referred to as the Emperor or Palpatine in the original movies. His Sith identity wasn't really known. In fact, we didn't really know him as Darth Sidious until the prequel. So Luke using this name suggests that his ongoing study of the Force, and perhaps communing with the Force ghosts of his father, Yoda, Obi-Wan, have recontextualized this political tyrant as the Sith he truly was. Moving on to the reveal of why Kylo Ren turned on Luke. Luke perceived Snoke's influence in Kylo's mind, became fearful, and drew his lightsaber on him to kill the boy in his sleep, causing Kylo to react defensively. Now, for a lot of fans, this turn was a little hard to swallow. I guess this is a little dark for Luke, but when you rewatch the original trilogy, this temptation by the dark side definitely has precedent. Remember, Luke tapped into the dark side when he fought Vader in Return of the Jedi. Letting his anger flow through him was how he was able to defeat his father. Luke also explains that this was a fleeting gut reaction to his fear, and that he immediately regretted even considering it. I should also point out that this concept of a man having to decide whether to kill a boy whom he knows will grow up to be evil and crazy powerful, basically the kill the Hitler baby debate of time travel, is what Looper, Ryan Johnson's previous film, is all about. Without spoiling anything from Looper, the solution involves trying to change the heart of the future villain by correcting the mistakes you made to make him that way, which is exactly what Luke tries to do in this movie. In another parallel to Luke in the past films, Rey furthers her training by descending into a cave where she experiences some trippy visions, though nothing like Luke's own face in a Darth Vader helmet like an empire. So what exactly is going on in this mirror scene? It's pretty impressionistic, but my best explanation of what we're seeing is an infinite number of rays reflecting back to her. Kind of like when you stand between two mirrors and you see an endless mirror tunnel. I think these are all slightly different versions of Rey along a spectrum between the light and the dark side. Rey begins the sequence facing one way, but then she turns to the darkest side, representing her turn to the dark side for answers about her parents. But then her perspective shifts so that she's now at the end of that dark side, asking the reflective surface to answer her core question. Who are her parents? And like the dark side always does after it lures you in, it does doesn't give you the answers it promised to deliver, it just leaves you with more questions. So this mirror only shows Rey's reflection, meaning her own selfish interests should be her focus, according to this mirror. At least this is how I read it. I ain't in Ryan Johnson's head yet. 
Inevitably, Rey turns on Luke, becoming what he feared the same way Kylo did. This is the classic Jedi folly. By withholding certain truths from their students to protect them, they turn the students away and force them to seek those answers from bad influences. You know, it's kind of like parents who are afraid to teach their kids about sex so those kids end up learning it from older bad kids on the playground or, you know, gross jokes by YouTubers. Boobs. <laughs> Moving on to Luke's attempt to burn the Unetti tree and the return of Yoda. Now I gotta say, I love the decision to depict Yoda in his classic Frank Oz voice puppet form from Empire and Return of the Jedi, as opposed to the CGI version that we saw in the prequels. Rather than that super serious version, Yoda was back to his old self here, cracking jokes, giggling, bopping Luke on the head with his cane, and then blowing our minds with some truly profound wisdom. In a way, that wisdom kind of sets us at ease too. The greatest teacher failure is... Yes, we don't need to see the characters score a too easy victory in this movie, despite how crowd pleasing it could be, a messy failure will show us way more of these characters' true colors. And we are what they grow beyond, that is the burden of all masters. Inevitably, the older generation must be surpassed by the younger generation. And that's okay, that's how we move forward as a society. Maybe Yoda's suggesting that it's not so crazy to say these new Star Wars movies can be better than the original ones. I mean, guys, they're essentially the same stories, but with better action, better jokes, better characters, better effects. Oh God, I can hear those million voices again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I also like how Luke parallels that past moment with Kylo. Both tortured souls came close to destroying a piece of their pasts. Luke, the Jedi Temple, and Kylo, his mother Leia, and then decide not to with their weakness overtaking them. But then nature takes its course and they lose what they loved anyway. Other TIE fighters took out Leia and Yoda summoned freaking lightning to ignite the tree. Also notice that Yoda shrugs off the ancient Jedi texts as they burn inside the tree, saying page turners they were not, and that they contain nothing the girl doesn't already possess. Now, hold on to this line because it comes back later. Meanwhile, when Finn, Rose, and DJ hack through the supremacy shields, DJ uses the term slice. Now, this is a reference to the EU books where slicer is a word for a hacker. This is the first time slicing has come up and been described this way in a Star Wars film. And speaking of nerdy references, we get this goofy misdirect when what looks like a shuttle releasing thrusters making a landing. Oh, but no, it's just a droid ironing some Imperial uniforms. This is a deep cut by Ryan Johnson to Hardware Wars, a short film released in 1978 that recreated Star Wars using household appliances as ships, including an iron. It was a big deal in the 70s and 80s when it was harder for fanboys to get their hands on any Star Wars content between the movies. Ah, to be alive in 2017 when half-hour breakdowns of Star Wars movies come out on YouTube within a week. Later on the Supremacy, there's this other spherical droid that spots BB-8 under the bin, kind of like an evil BB-8. Now his name is officially BB-9E, but the crew of The Last Jedi nicknamed him BB-H8, BB-8. Yeah, I uh, explained the joke, don't BB a hater. Shortly after this, they get caught and DJ reveals he betrayed them. Now basically, I guess DJ is kind of the Last Jedi equivalent of Lando Calrissian, a somewhat eccentric cool dude whom the heroes find on a luxurious neutral ground, whose neutrality leads him to turn over the heroes to the enemy. I'm not saying DJ is nearly as cool as Lando or nearly as well-developed a character, but he plays a parallel function in the plot. We also see the return of Captain Phasma, Gwendolyn Christie's character from The Force Awakens, aka Chrome Dome, as Finn later calls her. You may be wondering how Phasma escaped, considering Finn and Han just kind of left her in a trash compactor on Starkiller Base shortly before it blew up. Marvel Comics actually published a five-issue miniseries about Phasma that explained what happened. In the trash compactor, she apparently ran into a trash monster, similar to the Dianoga from the Death Star trash compactor, but she lucked out when a resistance bomb opened a hole in the chamber. She escaped, ran through a snowy forest where she saw Rey and Kylo fighting, and she escaped in a TIE fighter before the planet exploded. She also covered her tracks from when she lowered those shields, blaming it on another officer, Sol Rivas, and killing him. Yeah, not the best person. Later, many of those stormtroopers that we saw in the background lining up around Finn, Rose, and Phasma may contain a number of cameos. Now, it's rumored that the British princes, William and Harry, play stormtroopers, along with Tom Hardy and British actor Gary Barlow. Now, all these guys definitely shot scenes in stormtrooper armor but some of them may have been part of scenes that got cut. Then, after Poe's mutiny attempt on the Radis, Leia explains to him Holdo's true plan to gradually get the resistance to the abandoned secret rebel base on Crate. That Leia novel I mentioned earlier revealed that Crate was actually Leia's first introduction into the rebellion. As a young woman, she learned that her foster father, Bail Organa, was secretly sending supplies to Crate 
And upon investigation, discovered the whole rebel base there, and that Bill was part of the rebellion, and she decided to join as well. So the planet crate really goes back a long way for Leia and for Holdo. In this goodbye scene between Leia and Holdo, the dialogue was largely written by Carrie Fisher and Laura Dern, including them saying, may the force be with you at the same time. Carrie Fisher was a well-known script doctor and actually contributed a lot of lines to the script. Okay, let's move on to Rey surrendering herself to Kylo and Snoke on the supremacy. And he probably knows the parallels between this scene and Return of the Jedi, when and Luke surrenders himself to Vader and the Emperor, hoping to turn his father to the light. Rey is even framed the same way Luke was during his surrender, cuffed and off to the left of Kylo. All the beats of this scene, Snoke torturing Rey, showing her how her friends outside are dying, Kylo turning on his master, they're all parallel to Return of the Jedi. And if you listen closely, the music here is John Williams' Emperor's theme from that scene. And this almost feels like that kind of team-up victory that Luke and Vader experience. We get this amazingly choreographed lightsaber melee with Rey and Kylo teaming up. And in the final move, Rey shouts, Ben, as she assists with the lightsaber and he takes out the guard over the shoulder. It just feels like these two are gonna be together forever. But Ryan Johnson only does this to once again subvert our expectations. Rather than killing Snoke for redemptive reasons like Vader did with Palpatine and joining Rey in the light, Kylo reveals that he only did this with much darker intentions. I actually made a whole other video explaining Kylo's decision and how it's connected to his decision to kill his father in The Force Awakens and why the movie killed off Snoke at all. Go check it out. Another detail I liked here, Snoke getting severed at his midsection, including his hand getting severed at the wrist. This keeps The Last Jedi in the Star Wars tradition of characters getting freakishly amputated in every movie. Even a deleted scene from The Force Awakens features Unkar Plutt getting his arm ripped off by Chewie. Another moment of subverted expectations, Kylo reveals to Rey her parentage. And again, Johnson builds up this reveal by echoing a past Star Wars moment. Kylo tells her, you know the truth, which totally echoes Vader telling Luke, Search your feelings, you know it to be true. So at this moment, we're all feeling, shit, this is it, they're related, or something huge. Eh, not quite. They were nobody, Rey says, and Kylo responds, They were filthy junk traders who sold you off for drinking money. They're dead in a pauper's grave on the Jakku Desert. By taking away the preciousness of this reveal, Johnson forces us to focus on these two people in the room right now. And it leaves a hole in Rey's heart that Kylo is dangerous and close to filling. And the director keeps that idea of the hero being tempted to join the dark side while keeping alive that feeling of possibility that heroes really can come from anywhere. Which, to be honest, the original trilogy kind of lost by making Luke part of a famous bloodline. Holdo using the Radis' final light speed jump to tear through the supremacy is one of the coolest images a Star Wars scene has ever given us. The way Johnson cuts out the audio and just allows the pure visual element to speak for itself really makes this moment pop. The intercutting editing also helps build up to this climax. Rey and Kylo split Luke's lightsaber and Phasma orders execute as if all of these actions are part of one swift motion to split and execute the First Order flagship. And the fight that follows, I like the reveal that BB-8 was piloting the ATST, which felt like a nod to the reveal in Return of the Jedi that Chewbacca was piloting the walker. Moving to this film's third act on Crate. The world building of this planet is fantastic with these crystal fox creatures. They're called Vulptuses, or a singular Vulptex. Which, yeah, sounds a lot like the Pokemon Vulpix. And that's because they have a similar etymology. Vulp is a Latin meaning fox. The red mineral laden soil covered with a white salt layer creates such a vibrant contrast. The neutral white reflects reflecting the First Order Stormtroopers, and the crimson red reflecting the dying resistance, which has been hemorrhaging fighters this entire film. As their rust bucket speeders charge toward them, the stabilizing anchors make it look like they're bleeding across the landscape, as if this charge is doomed from the start. Really, the Battle of Crate totally echoes the Battle of Hoth in the best ways, mostly for the great visual of these massive walkers looming across the white tundra. Which, by the way, those are called gorilla walkers, which have these heavily armored front legs and are much larger than the older model Imperial AT-ATs, you can actually see some of those older models being used as scouts in this battle. And Chewie and Rey are just so much fun to watch in the Falcon. Seeing it outrun the TIE Fighters in the narrow red crystal cavern definitely echoes the Falcon's run through the second Death Star in Return of the Jedi. And during all this, we do get a little meta joke that this isn't a total Hoth ripoff. A Resistance fighter points out that the surface is salt, not ice. Actually, that fighter beside him is Gareth Edwards, who directed Rogue One. He allowed Ryan Johnson to make a 
cameo in Rogue One. Johnson was a Death Star operator on the catwalk that the focus beam fires out. There's actually a more important reason this scene wants us to pause and look at the red footprints in the salt that I'll get to in a bit. Poe ordering Finn to fall back shows an important step for his character's growth. He's essentially passing on the wisdom that Leia barked at him earlier, and that Yoda spoke to Luke. Failure sometimes is an option, and it's a valuable learning tool. Sometimes things are more complicated than jumping in a cockpit and blowing things up. What does it matter if no one survives to fight future battles? Poe learning this lesson definitely positions him to step up as a leader of the Resistance in Episode 9. Okay, let's talk about this gut-wrenching Luke and Leia reunion. Ryan Johnson said that the set on this day, the scene was shot, felt like a church. The way everyone became so quiet and reverent for the importance of this moment. And I think what I love most about this is the scene serves as a kind of secret funeral for Han Solo, even though he's never mentioned by name. It starts with Leia joking about her new hair, which is a line Carrie Fisher wrote, by the way. But remember, this braid is an Alderanian mourning tradition, reminding us about Han's death. And when Luke begins to talk, Leia just cuts him off, saying, I know. Now, it's a small moment, but for us Star Wars fans, I know is basically Leia code for I love you. Again, echoing Han. I know. And on top of all this, the music that plays here is John Williams' theme for Leia and Han from the original movies. And if it still wasn't clear, Luke says, no one's ever really gone, and gives Leia Han's lucky dice from the Falcon. Luke is essentially saying that no one truly departs this world so long as they live on in our memories. After this scene, there's another wink to Han. 3PO <laughs> begins to tell Poe the odds of their survival, 15,428 to one, and Poe snaps at him to shut up. This is a callback to Han snapping at 3PO in Empire. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. Another big twist comes at the end of the epic battle between Luke and Kylo when Luke reveals that it's not actually him there. He's still back on Notch 2. This is a force projection of himself. And if you were looking closely, there were a number of little clues that indicated this. First, Luke's appearance. He looks younger with shorter hair. This was the age he looked when he fought Ben in those flashback scenes, implying this is how he looked when Leia last saw him. Also, he just kind of magically appears inside the crate base even though they just established that there was no other way in or out of the mine, aside from those tiny cracks in the boulders that the Vulptuses slipped through. Most obviously, he uses his old blue lightsaber, which we just saw Rey and Kylo split in half in the Supremacy. Also, his lightsaber should have been the green one he had at the end of Return of the Jedi and those flashbacks. That's if he still even had it. He probably chucked it in some porg nest. But my favorite indicator are those red footprints in the salt that I mentioned earlier. Now, one shot shows us the close-up of Kylo's foot as it pivots in the salt, leaving a red mark. Shortly after, we see Luke's foot take a step, but the salt doesn't move. It's almost like his foot hovers over the salt. And while this all seems like another bonkers extension of Force abilities in this movie, there actually is precedence for this in the Expanded Universe stories. In the Dark Empire series, Luke projects doubles of himself, and in the Dawn of the Jedi comic series, Agents of the Dark Side project shadows of themselves across long distances without leaving their point of origin. But of course, Luke lowering his saber and allowing Kylo to strike him is definitely a nod to Obi-Wan's move against his former apprentice in the first film. <laughs> As he fades away, he taunts Kylo, see you around, kid. This is essentially Luke's version of, if you strike me down, I shall become more powerful than you can ever imagine. And this presents an interesting idea. Luke saying this here and telling Leia earlier, no one's ever really gone, suggests that the ghosts of the people Sith killed might continue to haunt them after their deaths. Like perhaps in addition to living on as a voice guiding Luke, Obi-Wan could have lived on in Vader's head too, driving him crazy. Like you better believe Luke's force ghost is gonna mess with Kylo every night hovering over his bed with a green lightsaber. Better line those sheets, Kylo. But it's also possible that the reason Kylo held back earlier when he had his mother in his sights was that another ghost was haunting him in that moment, his father, Han. On an emotional level, maybe he just didn't want a repeat of that pain that he felt from murdering the last parent. But man, I would love it if Kylo sees a literal ghost of Harrison Ford floating around him at all times, saying, Ben, if you fire on that bridge, both me and your mother are gonna be following you around. I know you don't want that. We get two more callbacks to the original trilogy. Rey has to use her force power to lift rocks to clear a path for the resistance, very similar to how Luke has to lift boulders back on Dagobah. And of course, Luke's final scene takes him back home to Tatooine as he watches a binary sunset 
feeling a sense of peace, and finding the purpose his character sought as a boy at the start of his journey. As a dozen or so remaining Resistance fighters escape on the Falcon, there's a quick shot of Finn looking in a drawer, and if you look closely, you can see those books, the ancient Jedi texts. Rey apparently took them from the tree on Ach 2 before it burned down. That gives new meaning to Yoda's words earlier, that the library inside contained nothing that the girl doesn't already possess. Now, it's still not totally clear what these books contain, maybe some textbook explanations of the Force, maybe instructions on how to build or repair lightsabers. Leia's final line of the film, we have everything we need, at first seems a little unclear, but it makes more sense in the film's great closing scene. Those kids from Canto Bight reenact the events of the Battle of Crate with toy versions of Luke and the First Order walkers. I just love how this bookends the film, which opened with a storybook framing line of a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, and closes with this framing scene that recontextualizes the previous events from the point of view of children. Almost as if to say, hey, don't take this too seriously. These stories are meant to be escapism from our dull lives and to appeal to our inner childlike sense of wonder and imagination. Also, it paints Luke with the legend status he initially hated, and it shows how that legend is actually more impactful than any on-the-ground victory or loss could have been. The story of the battle is being used as propaganda to recruit a new generation of resistance fighters. That is what Leia meant by having everything they need. They have an inspiring story. And most importantly, that story inspires someone who is essentially a nobody, a future Rey, with his own force abilities. He holds his broom handle like a lightsaber and looks to the stars to dream as one of those stars shoots across the night sky. As long as kids like this exist in the universe, there's always hope. And just to ruin this sweet moment for you, this same kid in the movie Looper did this. Yeah, the First Order screwed. Here's a question for you guys. Do you think Vice Admiral Holdo should have told Poe Dameron about her plan? Do you think that would have settled the difference between them? Or would have Poe have reacted even more obtusely to this strategy? And another question I'm curious to hear from you guys about. How does The Last Jedi rank for you compared to all the other Star Wars movies? Now for me, it goes the original Star Wars, then The Last Jedi, then The Empire Strikes Back, The Force Awakens, Revenge of the Sith, Return of the Jedi, Rogue One, Phantom Menace, then Attack of the Clones. That's right, Revenge of the Sith is a lot better than you remember. Go rewatch it. But I want to know your thoughts. Comment down below or tweet me directly at EA Voss and follow New Rockstars on Twitter at New Rockstars for updates on our videos. Like and share this video and subscribe to New Rockstars. And be sure to check out all the other Last Jedi videos we've been doing. A review we did as a panel, my explanation of Kylo's decision to kill Snoke, and my deeper analysis of why I think The Last Jedi is so polarizing among fans and why I think it deserves a another rewatch. If you really like this channel, you can contribute to us on Patreon. Big thanks to all of our donors, especially Kenny Smith. Guys, thanks for watching. Bye.